Allen here. Thanks everybody for watching. We have a very special guest today. We're talking with actor Amy Peets. I mean, I was going through your filmography and you have been a part of some phenomenal projects. Caroline in the City, of course, uh, The Office, uh, Hit the Road. Thank you for your time. I'm excited to chat with you. I'm, I know you've been busy, so I'm glad we were able to, to get this uh, done and have a really good conversation. So me too. Thanks for having me on your show, Brad. I really appreciate it. Yes. Well, let's start with Wolfpack because you play Kendra on that. And that's where this whole journey started for me to book you because I was doing press for that and watching the episodes and I saw you and I was like, oh, that's Amy. And then as I do a deep dive, typically with guests that I get the pleasure of chatting with, I was going through all of your work and you've been a part of some really amazing series, but I always like to start out and just talk about the fact that you've been doing this for so long. <laughs> yeah. I have. Where did the journey begin for you? Was it a friend? Was it family? Were, is it one of those situations where you were just drawn to the business? Uh, Cause you've been working for a very, very long time. Yeah. Over 30 years. I, um, I've been drawn to the business since I was a little girl, not the business. I've been drawn to performing okay. and um, living in the life of characters as opposed to my own life. Um, yeah. I originally wanted to be a ballerina and I studied dance very young and I had much older brothers, an empty basement in the summer, and not a lot of kids to play with in my neighborhood. And so it was me, myself, and I with my imagination and my keyboard and my uh, basement. And um, I, I was very, I was extremely introverted and shy. I didn't actually want to perform, but I wanted to create. And uh, that led me to having to get over my nerves and perform anyway. And I developed that throughout my childhood. And I was taught by a teacher who really encouraged me and brought me out of my shell in junior high school. And he later on performed my first wedding ceremony and he remains in my life. I think he saved my life. I went on to do this at an arts high school and then at a theater conservatory. And then I shortly after graduating from that came to Los Angeles and got cast on some TV shows and off I ran. So that's what I've been doing ever since. Was family supportive of your decision to do this? Because Every time I talk to somebody, it can go like many different avenues of support, whether it's like you're insane. Good luck to you. We'll see you in a year. <laughs> well, the family I was raised in is insane. And so, okay, they were, so it was um, like all they right. were oblivious to any difficulties and just thought, oh, well, I was raised in Wisconsin in a real working class uh, family. No one had gone to college in my immediate family. Okay. And so uh, they thought that I was just going to immediately go become famous and get on TV shows. And that's kind of what happened. So. Yeah, I was going to say, because I was looking at your filmography and I don't know, I know sometimes IMDb can be wonky as far as like the order of things. But I'm looking here, but Rudy, was that like one of your first? Okay. Yeah, that was my first film. Okay. Um, and uh, I was completely cut out of it, but uh, you'll see me <laughs> in the background, pregnant, uh, decorating a Christmas tree. But the experience was, of course, such a blast and such wonderful validation that I could start to make a living doing this kooky profession of ours. So, it is so weird. I, I've talked yeah. to so many fantastic people, present company included. And I, I always say this, I sound like a broken record on all my episodes, but really it, Jake Busey described it as like a traveling circus. It's like, you just have these vagabond people that go from place to place, town to town. And like, it's just a world that's so different than what most people would ever know about because exactly it's wild because I see you on TV. I see you on shows and I go, man, she has a very successful life by measure. But then like when I talk to you and others, it's like, it's a hard profession to be a part of because it's just yeah. not like anything else. You've got it right. I mean, what's rewarding about it is that 
every once in a while, the average actor, I'm an, I'm like a successful average working actor. Uh, but every once in a while you get a job. I mean, we're not working all the time for money. We're usually working for free. We're usually auditioning, trying to develop our, our own television shows or films or podcasts or, um, uh, comedy shows and doing readings for other people, helping other people get jobs, yeah. helping other people develop their projects, their heart and soul projects. And every once in a while we'll actually get hired. We get to show up on a set with 250 other vagabonds. And it, for me, every time I get hired, it feels like vacation. It's the rest of my life where I'm trying to get work that is not as fun. Um, no. I mean, I mean, I do enjoy my life and my dog and all that kind of stuff, but the, the career aspect of it really is very dreamy and wonderful when we do get to work those long days under weird conditions. Um, and, uh, and sometimes too brief and especially since COVID it's gotten really weird to be an actor and to be yeah. in the entertainment business since COVID. Um, not being able to have lunch with everyone together, having masks on, keeping your contact so separate. So everyone's in their cell phones and no auditions. I don't get to see all the women that mm. I um, am up for jobs uh, with. And so that was a huge social part of uh, my job in the past prior to COVID. And it felt so good to say, Hey, congratulations on that baby. Congratulations on your divorce. I see you got the job I wanted. Good for you, girl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? And, uh, and so that is missing. It, it's been a lot less fun since COVID. I must I've heard that from so many people. Like if nobody's ever spent any time on a set, it's a very commutative experience. Like you're eating lunch together. You've got the background folks. You've got the yeah. actors. Everybody's in there eating food, talking. And then it's gone from that to ordering food off an iPad from a trailer, having it delivered. Hopefully you get what you ordered. Uh, yeah, conversations and, have really ceased. And like, it's and, weird. Yeah, it's it's too bad. But um, they have loosened restrictions. I was grateful for those restrictions because nobody wants to die no. or get deathly ill or make someone they love deathly ill. So I'm glad that we're finally, most of us are vaccinated or have had it. And now we've got Paxlovid and we can get through it much easier if we do get it. And uh, productions don't have to shut down for as long. And um, so things are coming back. So that's good. Yes. I mean, at one point we were having conversations in our interviews with like, we don't know if this is ever going to happen again. You know, that I brings know. me to the evolution of the self tape. I know it's been a part of the business for some part of time, but really now more days, it seems from what I hear, that's how it's done now. Mm -hmm. How did you adjust to the self tape? What was that experience like for you as a storyteller and actor? Yeah, I would guess for the last 10 years, we've been doing self-tapes, but um, what I chose to do when COVID hit was immediately set up a much better technical studio for myself, Okay, learn how to love it, learn how to love editing, learn how to love lighting, learn how to love the aspects of it that are beneficial, um, try to be grateful that I don't have to drive across town. And if I screw up in the room, uh, I get another chance to do it for myself, learn how to love that aspect of it. But the worst part is not being um, able to get a sense from the people you're reading for yeah. what they are getting from your performance. If they seek some other quality, if, if they genuine, genuinely like your work, because uh, I... I've been really proud of the work I've been doing, but I get no feedback. So I'm doing it in a vacuum and uh, I'm, and it, and it wears on your spirit and your soul and your confidence to think, I think I'm doing good work, but uh, no one is saying, good job, Amy, you know, that was great or callbacks or anything. So it, it has taken a lot of self-generated positivity that I didn't rely on as much before. Yeah, I can imagine no 
in the moment note to do it or say it a different way. Now you have to make choices just period as an actor when you're auditioning for a part. You get your breakdown or your sides and you're like, okay, now I have to kind of figure this out and decide how I'm going to do this. So you get these shows and then muscle. That's a big project for you. Was that really your first moment as an actor where you're like, okay, this is like a big job and I'm not just doing a guest star or like a one episode or a two hander. This is like a big Yeah, this deal. was a huge benchmark in my career. It was my first series regular job. I was able to pay off my student loans. I was able to quit being a waitress. I was able to, uh, I mean, I, I cried with joy uh, in hearing the news. It's, it's winning the lottery when you get on your first series. And it was in the nineties when television um, was the superstar of everyone's living room and, and their audiences were not fractured because there were so few channels. Um, and so it, it was huge. It was huge. It was joyful. I learned so much. And, and as it turned out, um, the, 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 um, opportunities kept coming. And so it was a beautiful time in my career, in my life. I loved it. I mean, yes. it certainly went to Caroline in the city right after that. Yeah. So that was right after, and that was like a big hit. Annie Spadaro. That was a huge show. That was like during the time when it was like that show news radio, like all of these shows, as you said, Spin City were like massive TV. And we didn't have 500 streamers to choose from. People actually made appointments to sit down yeah. in front of their TV. Yeah. And watch it was something. water cooler stuff. I mean, we were sandwiched between Seinfeld and ER. Oh, wow. And friends were on that night. So it, 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 it couldn't have been a better era of television. And because we were with some of the best shows ever created, and our show, our show became the butt of jokes. People would make fun of Caroline in the city, but when I look back at it now, it was such high quality. It was, it, it, it still holds up today. And I'm very objective about it. I'm not one of those people who is um, hates watching myself or um, <laughs> cringes. I mean, I'll cringe if I do something bad, but I don't beat myself up about it. But I can, I can be pretty objective, especially after so much time has passed. And I got to hand it to Fred Bear and Marco Panette and Dottie Dartlin who created the show. And I, I just think the writing was super strong. They, they, the writing of, of situation comedies, I think decreased since the nineties and uh, yeah. got, got further away from the basic bare bones of storytelling um, that was sort of indicative of theater you know, that Mary Tyler Moore show and Cheers, all the people who were creating TV shows, 90s and pre-90s, um, had a sense of storytelling from the theater, from plays. And um, it got weaker and weaker as we got further and further away from that, I think. Yes. Well, there's such a paradox of choice now for people to watch. I want to ask, because you've done so many different types of roles, like what's important to you, uh, Amy, as an actor, as a storyteller? You're you've said you're you're a hardworking actor, a you know blue collar actor. You just get in there, you want to work, and you do all the other things too when you're not working. But when you get say a straight offer, if that's ever happened, or you audition for something, like what do you want? What are you looking for? That's a really good question. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. And and it has developed as I've aged and as my resume's gotten longer and longer over, you know, 375 episodes of television. I used to just want the splashiest, most impactful role that would make me come across as, you know, the the not the star, because I'm usually a supporting player, but as the um as the person who steals the show, at first I wanted to just steal the show, sure. no matter how big the role was, I wanted to make a big impact because I knew that that would increase the longevity of my career and I'd be able to keep doing this longer. Now, now I feel my, my importance is being the, co the best cog in the wheel and being of service to the story as much as possible. 
And usually now that means not acting. It means not opening up my bag of tricks to be splashy and make an impact and stand out. Now it means actually to blend in more, to disappear into the storytelling so that we're not looking at an actor's performance. We're just looking at that person who happens to be that role in that story. Tell, mm. the story. And the more I get into um, the craft of directing or the craft of writing or producing, which I've done in the past, it makes me feel much more fulfilled when my acting will disappear as opposed to stand out. Right. And I think that might even make you more noticeable. Let's say, let's talk about The Office. That comes to mind you play donna it's a very big splashy character you see several scenes with steve and all these different people and then you have like the role of Wolfpack, which is the opposite of that character but i would imagine when you're starting out you probably do want to be splashy because you it's that's probably going to help you get to other places as an actor and or maybe i don't know i mean the business has changed i'm certain from when you started to now, it's completely different. Greatly. And of course I've aged as it's changed. I'm now 54. And so as wonderful as it is to be my age right now in this industry, because there are so many more women behind the camera, mm -hmm. writing scripts, directing them and producing shows. Um, there's, it's still not quite there yet. But we're we're really on the cusp of breaking uh, breaking it open finally, um, and I, I would say you know the first time I walked into a room maybe fifteen years ago where every single person involved in the in the audition the creator the casting people the director and the writer were all women I literally it was a comedy but I was so moved to tears I couldn't believe that sitting before me was the future of entertainment and it mm. wasn't going to include even the implied uh sexual harassment that right. was prevalent soaked throughout every project every interaction it wasn't necessarily overt all the time although it was rife with overtness. I'm sure it was just implied at every moment that um, we were sexual objects to to be um, utilized, but not heard from. Whose point of view was not only undesirable, but threatening, and not uh, something they viewed as being. Um, a money-making point of view. Right. Uh, they didn't think that, that the audiences would want it. And so it's been quite emotional to be a woman in this industry going through it and and seeing and supporting uh, young creators. And I understand the threat that white men in our industry really feel right now. Sure. It's real. They're being pushed aside. Um, and uh it doesn't mean that I would ever cater to that fear or do anything differently than we're doing now. We need to train people of color, um, women, those in our, in our society who have never gotten the chance to tell their stories. We need to lift them up and we need to push them to the front of the line now. Uh, and if that means a white guy is going to lose his job, tough titties. Yeah, we've got more important things to do with uh, with this industry. Um, so that's how I feel about that. I got a little bit on a soapbox there. That's okay. Sorry. I love it. I it that's. I mean, we're cool with that. I I that's why we're here, uh, and that's what I find fascinating. I don't know. I'm sure you're aware because of your what you just said and how you want to help move this industry forward in a positive direction. You know, taking the broken toys of Hollywood throwing them away and really just revitalizing the industry. But it's interesting. It brings to mind a lot of these nineties Disney shows or TV shows. Now all these kids are grown up and they have podcasts and mm -hmm. some of them have come out against the networks that they were a part of and talked about shows that they were on and episodes they were on and how some of the things they did at the time seemed weird and odd and silly. Like, 
I can't remember. I don't want to speak out of turn about like a episode of a food fight and these girls getting covered in whipped cream and this whole thing. And it comes, food fight for like a young high school or junior high. Yeah. yeah. And then you mm -hmm. come to find out like some of these showrunners or writers had like really creepy fetishes and that was Completely. their way of like getting it out without having it happen at home is, is the best way I've heard it described. So it's so interesting, um, but that's okay. I mean, it's like, this is where we're at right now. And that's yeah, just it, how- That stuff well, should never have happened, but no, they ever. were in positions of power and they weren't going to give it up. And the nobody power dynamics were massive. So what are they going to do? It was so prevalent. I mean, it was like, if you're a fish, how do you see the water when you're a fish? Right. They were the fish and the water was the sexualization of young girls and women at the expense of their point of view or, or um, what they had to say or their part in the story. They, they truly, we truly were just props uh, for men's fantasies. And they kept saying it was because the demographics and the money and the eyeballs <laughs> watching and supporting that were young men, 18 to 24. Right. And so they couched it in the excuse of it's a part of the business because that's where the money is to be made And it. And it was actually lie, uh, lies because the biggest demographic was actually 50 to 60. It wasn't 18 to 24. It was people watching 60 minutes yeah. and the CBS viewer. Um, but you know, that's the shit that happens in this world when uh, there's an imbalance of power. And, uh, you know, what do they say? The arc of justice is long. <laughs> and so we're getting there. We're, yeah. we're starting to curve. Absolutely. Well, I want to talk about Wolfpack because that was such a great show. Again, the antithesis to some of the things that you've done. Very interesting character. Very interesting story. Um, them expanding this Teen Wolf universe. What was it about that project in particularly that interested you and made you want to do it? Um, the very first thing that interested me was that Jason Ensler, a very good friend of mine, directed the pilot. Okay. And I knew that it would be an exceptional looking, feeling, sounding, vibing pilot um, because I know his work and he's a friend. Then I read the script and I thought this has a real chance to be a hit because of the underlying themes that I loved in the pilot. Yeah. I loved how all the main characters, well, first of all, I love how global warming has caused these fires in California to, uh, to terrify communities and destroy them. I thought I was appreciative of that being dealt with. And that the kids in, involved in this story all were dealing with the ills of society and the pressures being put on them that are so immense right now. Yeah, I thought that was dealt with a really interesting and honest way. And that their superpowers they gain as becoming part of this wolf pack um, was a hopeful, empowering science fiction way of of entertaining them and still staying true to the truth of what we're all dealing with, the fear and the terror we're all dealing with. That is this underlying anxiety right now on our planet and at this time and post COVID. So it really spoke to me. That's and cool. the character I viewed as Mary Tyler Moore in ordinary people, just the, one of the most um, narcissistic and abusive mothers you can possibly have and uh, how she's destroying her son was also very honestly dealt with. And so I was attracted to that character as well. Yeah, we had Tyler Lawrence on uh, and he was just one of the nicest human beings we've ever spoken to. Oh, he he's lovely. Yeah, Very similar yeah. things that you just said about the show. And it's more than just, you know, what well, could have been something sexualized if it came out, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, maybe sooner than that. But it's just a really smart story. Again, you just looking at your filmography, you've had some really fun roles out of these characters that you've played. Is there one where you've learned something about yourself that you didn't know or didn't realize or maybe 
<coughs> related to on a very visceral level that you saw that same characteristic in yourself mm -hmm. in a character that you've played? Yeah, I mean, one that comes to mind, I, I don't know. One that comes to mind f f that's triggering me from whatever you said is I did a show called No Tomorrow. It was sort of a, a post, it was an apocalyptic romantic comedy. And I played a woman who on the page, uh, I could not figure out. Um, her name was Deirdre. And I decided to put her on the spectrum a bit. Uh, at the time I was married to someone who, um, wouldn't admit it at all, but I believe is on the spectrum and had quirks to their personalities that I wanted to explore. And I, and it really helped. And so I, 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 I at first I turned down the audition and I told my agent, like, I can't find my way into this character on the page. You know, I, I don't think I'm this person and I'm very straightforward and straight shooter. And I don't want this woman to just be an evil bitch. You know, let's, let's bring, <laughs> let's bring, she's a bad boss and mean and everything. And I thought, how do I bring her another vulnerable, like how do I make her vulnerability something she's hiding because she's terrified, not because she's narcissistic. Let's give her some other quality. And so I worked really hard on that audition and I ended up getting the darn thing. And, and it was so rewarding to explore that part of it, to understand my husband better. I, and I thought, I thought about all the discomfort he must've felt. I'm no longer married to him. Uh, <laughs> But we yeah, did. Yeah, I, did. I I knew that, but I was not going to mention that. But I yeah, <laughs> that, there we go. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm single. I'm single, and I am uh, looking for uh, uh, someone to date. So I'm just going to put that on your podcast right now. There you go. Um, date Mike. Yeah. Happy yeah. to meet myself. There we go. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so anyway, it really it really helped me understand maybe some of his his discomfort as he went through life. So it didn't really oh. teach me much uh, about me other than maybe I was being too harsh <laughs> and it really put me in his shoes. So that was fun. Very cool. Well, one last topic here as we wrap, I do want to talk about The Office because we were joking about it before we started recording. Such a fun storyline for you. Five fantastic episodes. How was that pitched to you? Because the character you play, you're a bar manager, you run into this guy, and then all of a sudden you're in the entanglements of an affair. He realizes that he's the mistress, which is so funny, <laughs> uh, which was an unexpected turn in that storyline. Well, you know, I sat down with the creators and had a meeting. I was asked to be a part of the meeting and that they had me in mind for a role. And they explained that they weren't going to tell me much about it. Oh, wow. And they said, let's just have a conversation and find out a little bit about you, Amy. And so my meeting was me just talking about who I am, what I was interested in, what my life was like, how I grew up. And they decided to write the role and hire me based on that. And so I really didn't know what was going to happen. I knew I was some kind of love potential love interest for Michael. And I didn't know if it'd be one episode. I didn't know if it'd be six. Uh, I didn't know if it'd be a season. So um, it was strange. It was strange. I'd never had that experience before. Based I've heard on, that for television, not for, for film I have, but not for television. Very interesting. Well, thank you so much for your time. Congratulations on all of this wolf pack of course which is available now and caroline on in the city is out there somewhere to stream on some network i'm certain um, probably and, amazon prime if i'm remembering correctly but i don't yeah know and that. all the other fantastic work and of course just the work that you do outside of acting in hollywood you know striking and making change and empowering women and just young creatives i think that's so inspiring because your business is so mysterious and there's not a lot of honest ways to figure it out. There's a lot of people out there who would like to shyster young women or just anybody in the business. And you take your time and graciousness as an actor who has had the fortitude and longevity and success and teaching them how to do it mm. the right way and not. That is lovely to hear. Thank very you. Very true. Yeah. It's very inspiring. And I think, a lot of our audience will connect with that because there are a lot of creatives that watch and listen and kind of just, you know, go, Hey, you know, I'm not alone in this 
weird world of creativity because it could be so fickle. Yeah. Just tell your story and be honest about it in its humor or its tragedy and get it out in the world. That's, I encourage everybody, no matter what size, shape, age, color to do it. Well, Amy, thank you so much. It was so much fun chatting with you. I really appreciate your time. You too, Brett. Have a great day. You too.